So, in the next uh, two sections, I'd like to discuss the four fundamental interactions of X-rays with biological tissue that are to be considered. Let's start out with Rayleigh scattering. In Rayleigh scattering, um, this happens when the light interacts with particles whose dimensions are much smaller than the wavelength of the light. So the dimension of the object um, x uh, is 2 pi, 2 pi r, roughly divided by lambda, if we express it, so the dimension of the object 2 pi r. With respect to the wavelength, we get this dimensionless parameter x, and for Rayleigh scattering to occur, this parameter x has to be much smaller than um, the, than 1. So, in other words, the wavelength has to be much bigger than the dimension or the radius of the scattering particle that is present. We have uh, an, a, an elastic scattering, so the photon energy is constant. We have the incident photon with a wavelength lambda 1. It is being scattered by the scatterer. It has, still has the wavelength lambda it has in the wavelength lambda 2, and for Rayleigh scattering, the condition is that lambda 1 is equals to lambda 2. In this case, since the photon does not change the wavelength, it does not change the energy, and therefore it is, it is non-ionizing, it is classical scattering of a wave uh, uh, with, with a particle. Now, the equation that I'm interested here to discuss is this one. And I'll just give it provided here without the derivation. This says that the intensity of the scattered light is equals to the incident light times some number of constants. And what we are really interested here is this term of 1 over lambda to the power of 4. So we'll just look at that. So the intensity is proportional to the density of the scattering particles rho divided by lambda to the power of 4. So what this means is, the shorter the wavelength of the light as it is being scattered, the higher is the intensity of the scattered light. So it means that uh, infrared light is less scattered and um, ultraviolet light is more scattered, or red light is less scattered, blue light is more scattered. And so what the observer, if here's the source, say the sun, we have particles in the air, that scatter the light, then the observer sees the intensity here more for the short wavelength, the scattered light, that is, blue. And this is essentially the reason why we see blue sky. Whenever you look at the sky, you see Rayleigh scattering, that's why our sky is blue. The sunlight is pretty much white when it comes in, but the sky that we see is blue because that is scattering in the atmosphere of the sunlight. Here's an illustration. You can actually reproduce the Rayleigh scattering in the, uh, at home. What you see in this video is as you fill the bathtub with water, water, if you look at water in a glass, it's clear. It has no color. But as you fill the bathtub with water, as you can see in this video, the color of the water turns increasingly blue. And this is because the light that incident is incident on the water is being scattered. And since the scattering occurs, intensity is proportional to 1 over the wavelength to the fourth power, we see increasingly the, the short wavelength light. That is, it goes towards the blue. We don't see as much of the red, and therefore it changes color. This is also the reason why the, the, uh, the lakes... When we look at lakes from, from outside, they are blue. Again, water itself has no color, but when we look at the scattering, that is a lake with sufficient depth, then we see that the water ha takes a bluish color. That is purely an effect of Rayleigh scattering. Another effect is, um, like I mentioned, the blue sky, but also the red sunset. So if you have a red sunset, it means that there are scattering particles in the air, this is typically either humidity or smog. So you have in areas where you have uh, pollution, but not too strong pollution, then you can have beautiful red sunsets. The red sunsets are a manifestation of the smog that's in the air. Um, or if you have humidity in the air, so just before a, a thunderstorm, for example, or, or before it starts to rain and the air is humid, then you also do get very um, 
colorful, very red sunsets. So this is an example here of a picture and the experiment that we will be showing um, shortly is illustrating in the classroom setting the, um, the effect of Rayleigh scattering demonstrated in the, with, with an experimental setup. In this experiment we will demonstrate the Rayleigh scattering, the effect that we see um, on moist or polluted evenings, uh, the red sunset. So what we have here is water, I will inject into it an alcohol, this will cr create uh, colloid particles with this mixture in here and start blocking out the short uh, wavelength light and only the long wavelength light will pass through here will be reflected by the mirror and we should see the, the reflection there of the light on the wall turn gradually into red. So what I will do is now I'll inject the solution This is chemistry, so we stir well. And now we'll just have to wait for the colloids to form. And this will take, take a while. So now we have the mixture in there. And we'll focus on here. We should start to see it gradually change color. Just like a sunset. At the same time, as only the red light passes through, we will be seeing this turn uh, bluish before it becomes um, so thick that we won't see anything, and that is basically simulating the situation as we have it in uh, some of the bigger cities in, uh, say, China, where the pollution is very thick. Now we're starting to see it's turning slightly reddish on here. It has started changing the color. And at the same time, if you look here, now you see this is, has become a little bit blue here. Clearly, it is becoming blue just like our sky because the red light, the, the long wavelength has been filtered out. Now it's increasing. Now we can see very clearly the changing color up here. So only the long wavelength light goes through, the short wavelength light is being scattered by Rayleigh scattering and you see how it simultaneously is turning here uh, increasingly um, bluish, that means the red light is, being fi uh, is passing through and it's only the blue light that is scattering. And now we have a really nice sunset here, it's getting more and more red and we're seeing here the, the blue light. So now that's typical of a sunset with very moist air or high pollution in the air. The sun is setting very red. We have the red light here. Um, so now you have the demonstration in classroom here of the Rayleigh scattering effect that explains to us why the sunsets are in moist air are uh, red in color as well as sometimes the moon when we catch it early in the morning. So now if we have Rayleigh scattering, as we will see, r scattered photons are not good for imaging. They, they, they have a deleterious effect on image quality. They are not good as the, as, as the light that's being scattered, the x-rays. Now fortunately for x-ray imaging, Rayleigh scattering is really not an important effect. It has a low probability of occurring in x-ray imaging. Now why is this so? Remember, we had the requirement that the wavelength must be longer than the dimensions of the scatterer. And we have introduced last week the relationship that we can calculate the energy in kiloelectron volts. It's equals to 1 over 1 1.2 over lambda, which is the wavelength in nanometers. So we can, from the photon energy, calculate the wavelength with this expression. And this is what we are doing here. So we'll take for 100 kiloelectron volts. We can calculate, therefore, 
uh, the wavelength, and we'll find that the wavelength for a 100 kilo electron volt photon is 0.012 nanometers, or it's a tenth of an angstrom. Now remember, we had the requirement that the wavelength of the X-ray should be large compared to the dimensions of the scatterer. Now atoms, the dimensions of atoms, are on the order of angstrom, and we are already here at a wavelength that is a fraction of an angstrom, and therefore we do not have scatterers that satisfy at these high photon energies the requirement for Rayleigh scattering to occur, and therefore its probability is very low and we can, for most part, uh, ignore its existence in the uh, X-ray imaging. If we take, for example, 100, uh, instead of 100 kilo electron volts, we take 10 kilo electron volt um, X-rays, then we're getting at a wavelength of, of 1.2 angstrom, 0.12 nanometers. This is still uh, very small compared to the size of most molecules um, that we... Um, encounter. Now I'd like to go on with a second effect and that's Compton scattering. Compton scattering is a very important um, effect and so we're going to spend a little bit more time discussing the Compton effect. What happens in Compton in, in this type of scattering? We have an incident x-ray. That x-ray interacts with an outer shell electron. This outer shell electron is then ejected and a scattered x-ray is being produced. Here's an example of an experiment that illustrates the Compton effect. We have an X-ray that is incident and then a electron is being produced, a free electron, it's ionizing. This is measured in a magnetic field so the electron undergoes this spiral trajectory until it, it comes to rest. This is a cl uh, cloud chamber demonstration of the electron that's being produced. So we have, we have a cha chamber with saturated um, water vapor. We have here the, uh, the source of radioactivity. These are beta particles. And when I depress the, the, um, the tension in this chamber, we will see the condensation of the uh, electrons as they pass through the saturated um, water vapor. Three, two, one. OK, to come back to Compton scattering, it occurs at the outer shell electrons. It leads to ionization, producing um, a ionized atom and an electron. So what we are really looking at the process here is we have an incident photon, we have an electron, we have a scattered electron, new prime, and we have the ejected electron. We'll suppose that the electron is at rest initially and it gains energy through this scattering process. Now this process can be viewed as a simple collision. And for this collision we will neglect the, ener the binding energy of the outer shell electron. Why can we do that? Well consider we have an incident photon with an energy of 100 kilo electron volt and we have a binding shell energy of an outer shell electron of say two and a half kilo electron, uh, two, uh, two and a half kilo electron volt this is 2.5% of the energy of the photon. So we'll make a very good approximation assuming that we can neglect the binding energy of the outer shell electron. Compton effect is named after Sir Arthur Holly Compton. He received for his discovery of this effect, named after him, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1927. So we produce a scattered photon. This scattered photon has subsequent interactions in the tissue. These can be um, what we've discussed. These can be then Rayleigh scattering. They can be uh, subsequent Compton events, Compton scattering, or what is what we will discuss after the Compton effect, uh, photoelectric effects. So there are subsequent interactions for this photon. In general, the probability for Compton scattering to occur, it increases with photon energy and it increases with electron density. The second one makes sense. As the electron density increases, there are more outer shell electrons present in the tissue, so the probability of the X-ray interacting with an outer shell electron increases. Now, 
Um, typically in tissues, we have the electron to mass density is constant. Um, it's pretty much constant. And so the electron density is largely independent of the atomic number. And so the Compton effect is pretty much proportional to the density of the material. So we are going to take you back to a brief tour of first year physics. Most of you probably have had some special relativis relativity in your first year physics courses or later. But basically the phenomenon that we are observing here is we have a photon that imparts the electron, the electron is, is, is gains momentum and the photon is deviated here by this angle theta. So the incident photon hits the electron here, the electron is ejected in a certain distance and the photon is deflected by this angle theta. And so we will take now the definition of linear momentum in its relativistic form. So linear momentum is mass times velocity. The mass here is the rest mass time divided by the square root of this factor. That's the relativistic mass times the velocity. That's the relativistic expression for, for linear momentum. We can now calculate the magnitude of linear momentum, that is, take the scalar product of linear momentum with itself. We get this expression here on the right. That's just multiplying this with itself. And then we can actually show that the value of p, that is the norm of p, is equal to e squared minus m0 c squared, m0 squared c to the power of 4. We'll take um, the relativistic energy, that's m0, that's, that's this term, that's the relativistic kinetic energy, mass as a function of velocity, that's this term here, times c squared, that's the famous formula of this gentleman here, e equals mc squared, and we'll take uh, this term here, um, which is um, added here, and when we sub uh, do the calculation here, then we find that this term here, so we've taken this term here, minus this, we've replaced e squared with mc squared, so that's mc to the power of 4, m is here, that's this term squared. We'll take this term here, which is this term here, but we'll, we'll have made the denominator the same, and then we obtain, uh, we can simplify this and we'll find that this term here is equal to the linear momentum times the speed of light squared. So to summarize, we have a vector problem, incident linear momentum of the photon, we have the linear momentum of the electron afterwards and the linear momentum of the photon afterwards, and here the scattering of the light ha happens by, of the uh, photon happens by the angle theta. So to conclude this, we have a relationship between p squared, that is the value of p in squared, is equal to this term here. Now there are some interesting consequences. We know that light carries energy. If we go outside we warm up in sunlight, so obviously the light that comes from the sun carries energy. Yet light moves at, by definition, by the speed of light. So if we look at this expression here, um, for the mass, if the light had a mass, then it would have, at the speed of light, infinite mass. So this means that the photon with an energy E is a particle with rest mass equals to zero. So we have a rest mass m0 equals zero, otherwise we would end up here with an infinite linear momentum and its energy would be infinite since the speed of a light particle equals to the speed of light. So what follows from this, with this general equation here, it follows that the linear momentum of a photon is equals to the en its energy divided by the speed of light. And we are going to use this relationship in the following to derive the Compton relationship that is so essential for X-ray imaging techniques. So, if we are looking at Compton scattering, um, it is actually, as I pointed out, it is a simple elastic condition. We have conservation of energy, that is, the energy of the photon, the incident photon, the initial energy of the photon, the rest energy of the electron, mez squared, is equal to the final energy of the photon and the total energy of the 
electron. This is before and this is after. So I will now take the term and isolate the energy of the electron after the collision. So we'll isolate this term here. That is, we'll just move EF to the other side and we'll have this term here. Now we also, since the collision, we have conservation of linear momentum. It's an isolated system. Initially, the only momentum that we have is that of the incident photon. And then after the collision, the final momentum of the photon and the momentum of the electron. So this is before and this is after. And here again I will isolate the term linked to the electron after the collision, PE, and will square it. So PE squared is equal to the initial photon energy, uh, photon momentum minus the final photon momentum squared. And now we'll use the relationship that PE squared is equal to the energy of the electron squared divided by C squared minus ME squared C squared, which is what we just derived on the previous slide. We'll use this two equations. We have PE squared. We have an expression for that. We have the energy of the electron afterwards also. We have an expression for the two. We'll plug it into this equation and solve for the energy of the scattered photon, the final energy. So what we see in this relationship is that the final energy of the photon depends on the initial energy of the photon, but also depends on the angle theta. And this is what's important here is, if we know the incident energy of the photon, EI, this term here, and we know by what angle the photon, uh, and we know the energy of the photon, we can measure the energy of the photon that is detected. From that relationship, we can say something about by what angle the photon has been scattered. And this is um, used in the X-ray techniques. I want to now also show another uh, version of the Compton formula. That is, if we use the definition for wavelength and for the energy here, we replace now the energies with, with wavelength. Then we get the so-called Compton shift. That is a shift in wavelength. That's the final, the, the wavelength of the scattered photon minus the wavelength of the initial photon is equal to this number of fundamental constants, Planck's constant, the mass of the electron, speed of light, times 1 minus cosine theta. That is the angle by which the photon has been scattered. So let's look at some relationships. The final energy is maximal if theta is equal to 0. We can uh, verify that. Then we get in the denominator here. This term is 0. And therefore, the final energy of the photon after scattering is equal to the initial energy. It's as if the electron hasn't, um, doesn't exist. That is logical, because if it doesn't uh, scatter, then it does not lose any energy. The energy of the photon is minimal if theta is equal to pi. That is, it's backscattered. The photon moves, hits the electron, and comes back in the same trajectory. So the scattering angle is 180 degrees, or equals to pi. And then we can calculate, for this case, the minimum energy of the photon after the scattering event is given by this expression. It's simply having cosine theta equals to minus 1. Then we get the term 2 here. That's this term. So these are two particular cases. One case that is of interest, as we will see uh, in, in three weeks, is if the energy of the photon that comes in is equal to the rest energy of the electron, MEC squared. Um, that's for positron emission tomography. And in this case, if EI over MEC squared is 1, then we have MEC squared here for the incident energy. That's we're just replacing this relationship here. And we have in the uh, denominator 2 minus cosine theta. So let's look now on the y-axis. We have the final energy, the scattered energy, divided by the instant energy on the y-axis as a function of the angle here now in degrees. And we'll have now two uh, popular cases. One is metastable technetium, very often used in, in medical imaging. Here the energy relative to the rest energy of the electron is equals 0.27. That's this case here. And for positron emission tomography, that is this case here, we have the energy of the photon is equals to MEC squared. We have this relationship um, that is seen 
here. So it's a stronger dependence. Now, what is the crit critical um, element here? The critical element here is we have the effect depends on the photon energies Im implicated. So it depends on the isotope that's being used or the X-ray that's being used. But also what is crucial here is if we can calculate the final energy relative to the initial energy, if we can measure that, then we can say, well, this photon has been scattered by 90 degrees. And if it's been scattered by 90 degrees and we detect it, then it's not a good photon. It's been scattered too much and it's likely to represent an effect in an, in an area of the tissue where we don't want to measure. And so based on this energy discrimination, we can eliminate um, heavily scattered photons. Okay, so what we have here is a demonstration of the Compton effect. We have the radioactive source here, that's the X-ray tube, which we've discussed last week, how the X-rays are being produced in the tube. There's a little plastic element in the middle that serves as the scatterer, and the detector is here. So at this point we have a strong deflection angle, and what we are measuring and what you're hearing is the energy of the photons detected. So we can see now at this big angle of deflection we have a count of 260, the number is not important what it means. And as I now reduce the angle between the beam, which is emitted in this direction, we can see that this gradually increases. As the angle gets closer to zero degree, that is the photon energy increases, we have the scatterer here. And as we're going close to uh, zero degree, we have a very high counts so a very high photon energy uh, in, in, in this direction. I'll increase the angle again away from zero and we can see how as I gradually increase the angle the photon energy is being reduced.